Hi, I'm Alex Grieve, better known as IB Crazy, and this is Success in FPV Part 12, Tools of the Trade. Video piloting is still a do-it-yourself hobby. There are many more plug-and-play systems coming out every day to make it much simpler. But the truth is, the best systems are the ones that you assemble yourself. Why? Because nobody knows what your specific needs are, except you. One of the most important tools you can purchase for FPV is this, a soldering iron. A good soldering iron to an FPV hobbyist is worth its weight in gold. I recommend a good temperature controlled soldering iron, but if you're on a budget, a cheap Walmart special $10 soldering iron will do just fine. Um, the tips will wear out quite fast and it'll leave a lot to be desired, but in a pinch it'll get the job done. If you're going for the cheap iron, if you're using a lead bearing solder, you're going to want an iron somewhere between 20 and 30 watts. If you're using a lead free solder, then you're going to want 30 to 45 watts. Now if you have a little bit more money to spend, I highly recommend a temperature controlled soldering iron. A cheapie that can be found on eBay and other places is AOU936. It can be found for about $45. The tips last a fair amount of time. It's good, it's temperature controlled, and it works great. However, if you want a real soldering iron, there are a few to look into. My personal favorite is the Weller WESD51 with a nice digital readout. A less expensive unit that some of my employees very much like is the Hako FX888D, also a digital controlled soldering iron. I tend to prefer the Weller as it tends to control heat a little bit better. Also, an inexpensive model of the Weller is the Weller WES51. It's the same iron, just doesn't have a digital readout. Now, remember, more heat is not always better. When soldering, Resist the urge to crank that heat all the way up to do the job faster. You want to have just enough heat to do the job and let the joint cool an adequate amount of time. Soldering properly is all about heating the components correctly. For this, I'm going to solder up a simple video transmitter. As you can see, this is not a standard RC connector on the end of my video transmitter. I like these, servo connectors. So, another tool you might want to invest in is a good set of wire strippers. I got these from SparkFun for $5. Definitely a tool you want to have. Works a lot better than just your old diagonal cutters. Okay, so first we're going to cut the connectors off because this is totally useless to me. I can't connect to it, so goodbye. Then I'm gonna take my wire strippers and strip maybe 3 16 of an inch, you know, two or three millimeters off of my wires. To insulate my wires, heat shrink tubing does wonders. Slip it over your wires. And when the job is done, simply slip it over the joint, heat it up, and you're ready to go. The key to soldering properly is to heat up the component with the soldering iron, not the solder. The way I do this is simply touch the soldering iron to the end of the wire, and then touch my solder right below the base and let it wick down. Now your soldering now your soldering iron is going to get is going to get dirty quite quick. That's where this little guy comes in handy, a brass sponge. Stab it in a couple of times, tips nice and clean. So to solder, bring your wires close together, both tinned up, heat up, remove the heat and let cool. Do not blow on the soldering joint to cool it down fast. This will result in a cold solder joint and cause it to fracture or break.
Once completed, give your wires a good tug to be sure they're on there good. Once they're on, slide your heat shrink over. And if you happen to have a hot air rework tool, or a heat gun, or even a lighter, those are all great to heat up your heat shrink and shrink it down. One note about soldering safety is the flux fumes. When soldering, it's good to, to be in a well-ventilated area or have a fan blowing to simply move the fumes away from your face and not breathe them in. Breathing flux fumes in will result in chest pains. You'll have cramps. It won't necessarily be hard to breathe, but it'll be very irritating, and the cramps can be quite painful. They also come anywhere from 12 to 24 hours after your exposure. So try not to breathe in flux fumes. One thing to consider is a soldering iron with a fume extractor built into it, such as this. This is part of my hot air rework station. It's a AOU968. It works fairly well, not great. I prefer a fume extractor or a fan, but in a pinch, when I don't have one handy, this works great. Another tool you want to familiarize yourself with is a multi-tester, or more accurately, a voltmeter. When troubleshooting an electrical system, you can't see the electricity, but your voltmeter can. Any cheap voltmeter will do. If you get a digital voltmeter, you're going to want to set it on the 20 volts DC setting. Make sure it's on DC at 20 volts to check for things working when powered up. Plug in your battery so you have voltage through the whole system, set your meter to DC, and start playing. One of the things to do is get a lead, these are called banana plugs, and they accept these clips, often called alligator clips. For the ground lead, the ground runs the whole way through your video system. It's common to every component. So all you need to do is clip this lead to any exposed ground wire. Now be careful not to short anything out. Only clip one wire. You can clip it to the battery, the balance port, the speed control, anywhere that has a negative connection. In this case, I'm going to use a power supply just to illustrate the point. The positive lead, I'm going to use a probe. Now can the negative lead be a probe? Sure, you just have to be sure you're poking two in the, in the right place and so you don't shift, I find it easier just to clamp onto a negative and let it go. The positive lead allows you to poke around the component and trace your voltage. When troubleshooting a component, the easiest thing to do is start at the battery and move closer and closer to the component, looking for where the voltage drops off to where it's not normal. All you have to do is make contact and you will see your voltmeter reading. As you're probing around, if you find a component that suddenly re reads zero or the numbers just kind of go all over the place and don't really stay solid, you probably found your disconnection between then and when the voltage read what it was supposed to be. Very effective tool, excellent for troubleshooting a failed component. Another device you might, might want to consider obtaining is a frequency counter. A frequency counter simply tells you the frequency of the strongest device near it. And some of them have a little signal strength meter to give you an idea about how much transmit power is coming out. They're not very accurate, but good enough for quick tests. All you do is turn on your frequency counter and turn it, turn your whatever device you want to see the frequency on and put it up close. And it will read the frequency. And as you can see, this thing is reading 000Y. This is a 2.4 gigahertz transmitter. Why is it working? because I wired it backwards. Troubleshot that really quick. Let's hook it up properly. Okay, now that I've actually hooked up my transmitter properly, you can see my frequency counter is reading 2396 megahertz. This is excellent for times when you don't want to have channel conflicts. A lot of your video transmitters and receivers don't exactly tell you what frequency they're on, so this little device is a quick check to see, one, if you're even transmitting in the first place, like my previous problem, or two, what channel 
I should be transmitting on. And of course, when you change the channel here, you can see that the frequency changes on my device. Now this unit is the IBQ. It's my personal favorite frequency counter just because it's got a few more options. But the truth is, is you can go with this cheap GUIT transmitter. It's about $25, $30. You can find them all over the place. Press the button down, it turns on, it works. Close enough, extend your little antenna and put it near whatever component. The next step up from a frequency counter is a spectrum analyzer. Now, a spectrum analyzer doesn't have to be expensive. Sure, there are many of them out there upwards of $10,000. For this hobby, you don't need that kind of spectrum analyzer. A simple one like this RF Explorer does great. It stays in my pouch, and when I need to know the ambient noise floor, simply turn it on, put my video frequency on the screen, and take a readout. The great thing about a spectrum analyzer is it tells you exactly what channel is best to run on. In this case, I have my spectrum analyzer set to 1.3 gigahertz. So I'm showing the 1280 and 1258 band. And you can see at the bottom of the screen, the spectrum analyzer shows a fairly low graph the whole way through, which means either channel works. However, I haven't done one thing. I haven't turned on my LRS radio. And some LRS are cleaner than others. All right, as you can see on the spectrum analyzer, I'm showing a relatively low noise floor. Minus 97 dB. That's very low. I know my receiver sensitivity is only about minus 90 to minus 95. However, I haven't turned on my LRS yet. Okay, now that you see that the LRS is on, I'm starting to see spikes. This one is 1254 megahertz, so I've got some spurs on 1254. Now, mind you, it doesn't seem to be terrible, but like I said, some LRS are better than others. I have another LRS in here for testing. Let's see how it does. As you can see, this LRS is significantly worse over here near the 1280 band and is a little bit cleaner on 1258, but this LRS is significantly noisier than my current unit. This little device is great. It's expensive, maybe $250, but if you're serious about FPV and looking to do a long range flight, this is one tool you absolutely must have in your toolbox to ensure success. I highly recommend it. One of the great pleasures in FPV is building your own antennas. And to measure them, you can find one of these, a directional coupler. A directional coupler po passes power through the unit and what comes back, or reflected power, goes up this port. What that does is shows you how much power is coming back at your system. Now you'll need to make a little detector circuit with a microwave diode and a resistor and a capacitor, which you can find on FPV Lab or RC Groups under the DIY SWR meter. Of course, some of us have the ultimate toy, the Vector Network Analyzer. This is way beyond what any do-it-yourselfer needs, but I found out a lot of do-it-yourselfers have access to one of these or have a friend who knows where they can get, get a hold of one of these, you will learn so much about RF from one of these guys. They do things like Smith charts and other readings. If you have your ch a chance to get a hold of one of these, screw on your antenna and just play with it and see what happens. Learn the Smith chart function, it's great. But uh, these things start at about $12,000, so not really what I'd consider affordable. But if you know somebody that has one, See if they'll let you play with it for a couple hours. Highly recommend it. This has been an overview of the tools of the trade. I might be crazy, but keep your wings in the sky.